Recently, the most common asked question that I'm receiving as an instructor is how do I build a home lab in order to be able to practice for the enterprise infrastructure exam? Well, that's going to be a tall ask in some areas. There's a lot of things that can be virtualized inside of utilities like Eve and CML and the GNS3 platform. But at the same time, there's still going to be some things that are going to require us to have access to some higher end servers as well as some devices. Now, depending on your budget, my hope is to outline how to most cost effectively implement a lab environment. Now, this is not a tutorial on how to build a lab for yourself. I'm not telling you what to go out and buy. I'm not telling you how to acquire things. What I am telling you is, is that this is the way that I did it in order to be able to build my own internal lab environment for the purposes of practicing and using the labs and class materials that I've developed. Now, in order to be able to do this, we're going to need to have a server. Now, the server that I am currently using... If I switch over to my servers and clusters, what we will see is I have a server located right here at 10.1.0.117 in my internal lab. Now, this is not a small server by any stretch of the imagination. It has 80 logical processors, four network interface cards, and I am running a 3698v4 CPU. In fact, I'm running two of them inside of a Dell PowerEdge 630. Now, my objective in this walkthrough is to demonstrate the smallest footprint that I've been able to find to work, one, reliably, and two, be stable in my lab environment. I have experimented with much smaller number of resources. As an example, I played around with a 48 CPU configuration, and it worked about 70% of the time. When it stopped working, it was catastrophic. I was unable to get containers to reload and to operate, and it just caused me a significant amount of problems. As such, I did not feel that it would be worthwhile for me to to pursue creating a DNA center in a footprint that was going to be smaller than 62 CPUs. Now, the recommendation is 88 and higher from Cisco itself, so 62 might not seem like a very, very low-end server by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a server size that is going to fall in the vicinity. By the time you take a look at it, if you have 62 CPUs or 62 virtual cores, so it's going to be 32 CPUs uh, total with two threads each, that's going to give you 60, 64 possible CPUs. You're looking at about $1,300 to acquire a server that this DNA center would fit in. Uh, if you go up to about 2000 you can afford a server that would run both your ICE engine and your DNA center, then that's pretty much what I've done. But right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate the process and mechanism behind building a virtual DNA center. This virtual DNA center will be for the purposes of the home lab infrastructure that I'm building here in order to be able to illustrate how you would create a home lab and how, or how I would create a home lab on a shoestring budget. So let's take a look at what needs to happen here. All I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my VMs and templates and under the folder for my DNA centers, I'm going to right click and I'm going to create a new virtual machine. The virtual machine that I'm going to create is going to be called my home lab DNAC. In fact, I'm going to put VDNAC. It's not a supported concept, but it is a virtualized DNA center. And I'm going to put it in the folder specified. It's going to go on that server that I have implemented. I am going to create it using my baseline policy. It will be compatible with ESXi version 6.7. And later. And the format that I'm going to choose is not an exact fit, but it's one of the most stable fits that I've found, and that's going to be a, an Ubuntu Linux 64 bit image. And now, what I want to do is I want to apply the configurations. Now, 
Again, this is an example of the smallest footprint that I've been able to deploy that is going to be as stable and as resilient as possible while still taking up the least amount of resources. So it's kind of a middle-of-the-road approach. The more CPUs and the more RAM that you can throw at this virtual machine, the better off you're going to be. But at the same time, I understand that the key word that I used was budget. Now, buying a smaller machine or utilizing a smaller set of resources out of a larger machine might make sense in the short run, but in the long run, I promise you it will cause you problems because it did exactly that to me. So let's go ahead and create this virtual machine. I'm going to give it a total of 62 CPUs. I am going to allocate 256 gigs of RAM. I am going to create a hard drive, which is going to be 600 gigs in size. And I'm also going to go to my CPU and I'm going to expose hardware assisted virtualization to the guest OS. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to assign a second network device. So I'm going to go ahead and assign a network device. And the first network device that I'm going to be using is going to be for the purposes of management. And I'm going to connect it to my internal network. My second virtual network interface that I'm going to be using will be attached to a port group called Enterprise. And this is going to be the resources that are actually going to... Um, actually, let me reverse this. I'm going to go to Enterprise, and then my second interface will be for my VM network. So the first interface is going to be the interface that is going to be pointing to the devices that I want to manage. The second interface is going to be the interface that I'm going to use for my internal management of this DNA center. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select a data store ISO file for my bootable image. I'm going to go to my data store 117, which is the server, the data store for this specific server. I am going to go to images and under images, I will actually have a DNA center set. And the one that I'm going to pick out of this listing is going to be the software version 1317, which is going to be the ISO. I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. And I want to say I want to connect that power on. Let's see. That should be good to go. 600 gigs. More would be better. I prefer to use at least uh, uh, one terabyte. My recommendation for this is that this should also be solid state. This needs to be a solid state drive. And again, that's for performance. I'm going to hit next. I'm going to hit finish. And then what we're going to do is we're going to power this guy on once it's created. So I'm going to go to my home lab, VNIC. I'm going to go to my summary and I'm going to fire off this machine. I am going to open a console to this VM, and we are going to go through the installation wizard. I'm going to select the Maglev installer. I'll let it accelerate this in post-production. System is going to validate read write speeds to the main disk. In this case, it's going to be the only disk. And we're going to be asked if we want to start the installation of this DNA center cluster. I'm going to say yes by hitting enter. Now, the first interface that I'm going to be using is going to be my enterprise interface. This is going to be the interface that's going to be pointing towards the devices that I want to use the DNAC to manage. In other words, it's going to be pointing towards my lab, both physical and virtual. I'm going to give it an IP address of 100.64.0.101 with a mask of 255.255.255.0. And I am not going to specify a gateway of last resort, and I'm going to point it to an internal DNS server that doesn't exist yet called 183.1.1.1.1. I'm not going to apply any static routes. However, as this, this video series progresses, we will want to add some. And I am not using this interface for the purposes of creating a cluster. The next interface that we're going to employ will be used. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change its IP address to 10.1.97.101. 
and it's going to be a slash 16. And I will define the gateway of last resort because this is going to be the way that I'm going to get to the outside world. And I'll go ahead and use the DNS server of 8.8.8.8. .8 no static routes, but I do want to enable this as a cluster interface. Now, whether we implement a cluster in reality or not doesn't matter. The DNAC is going to require us to provide an address for the cluster, and it's also going to ask us some additional questions that at first might seem strange, but what we'll do is we'll entertain those as they pop up. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and hit next, and then we will move to proceed, and the system is now going to validate those network configurations, and if everything meets its satisfaction, what it will do is it will present me with the next set of instructions. In step 11, we're going to be asked to enter our maglev cluster details. I'm not going to build the cluster. And these are optional. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit next. In step 13, the system is going to require us to provide the passwords we're going to use to administer this device and to access it from the command line. Yes, the DNAC has an operating system called, it is the Maglev operating system. And in order to be able to interact with a platform using the CLI, we need to be able to authenticate. So at this particular juncture, I'm going to go ahead and use the password of ICE is cool. ICE is cool. We'll repeat it here. And then I'm just going to navigate down to the administrator password and use the same one. ICE is cool. ICE is cool. Now, would this be something that I do in production? No, not on your life. But this is a lab, and this is going to end up being our point of interaction with Cisco's SDA infrastructure. In step 14, I'm being asked to identify any network time protocol servers I want to use. I'm going to use time.google.com. And we will navigate to next. And now that NTP server is going to need to be validated. NTP is very critical to internal operations of a DNA center, having, having a lot to do with both troubleshooting, assurance, as well as the operational capabilities of the Docker containers that will represent our core services. Now that the NTP has been validated, we need to provide two blocks of addresses that will be utilized by the DNA Center to apply addresses to an internal network that is going to interconnect all of the Docker containers that are going to be supported in what will ultimately be a K8 or a Kubernetes environment. Every service, every capability, every feature inside of the DNA Center will be supported by one or more Docker containers. So we need to apply ranges of addresses the minimum size will be slash 21, and I'm just arbitrarily going to use 172.16.0.0 slash 21 and 117.16.8.0 slash 21. Now, the recommendation is, is that these addresses should not be used anywhere else in our infrastructure. As a result, what I'm saying is, is they cannot overlap with any addressing space that will exist inside of our enterprise network. In other words, the resources that we're going to be managing. I'm going to go ahead and select next and move to proceed, and the system will then go through and do some additional validations and configurations in order to be able to establish a working cluster. Now, this process is going to take some time. And once it kicks off, I'll let it run for a little while. And then what we're going to do is we're going to stop this video. And in part two, what I will do is I will pick up once the installation has successfully been completed. Again, this is going to take two, three hours before the system is going to be ready for us to access it. Now, my litmus test will be to determine whether or not I can access the DNA center using my browser. Once I can log into my browser and I can look at the user interface, the dashboards that will be presented to me, that'll be when I'm going to make the determination as to whether or not the DNA center is ready to proceed. That means that we'll need to update software. We'll need to make certain that we're running the most recent versions of those containers that I described for this version of our operating system, which is old, but the 3. Dot, well, I'm sorry, the 1.3.1.7 operating system is going to be the closest operating system that I've been able to find to what you will experience in the actual lab. 
my baseline recommendation and the, the most stable version of one is going to end up being 1.3.3.9. But again, it's newer than what you would see in the lab. Obviously, it's more stable and has more capabilities. And I'm trying to create an environment to where if I was building a home lab, I would want to be as close to the resources and the revision types specified in the outline for our blueprint. Let's go ahead and let this continue in the background. And in part two of this video, we'll finish the installation. Or let's, let's say we'll do the next set of steps for the installation because this is going to take a while. And then once it's all done, what we're going to want to do is we're going to get a snapshot of this so that we ha don't have to go through this again. I'll see you guys in the next video.